All right, uh, welcome John. John Stanton has a background uh, of over 50 years experience in the pharmaceutical and healthcare industries, uh, including 20 years directly involved in the sun protection product testing. Uh, John is a life member of the ASCC and serves in a number of industry representative roles with uh, ASMI, uh, Accord and Standards. He is the Australian representative to the ISO Committee on Sunscreen Testing TC217, uh, the Committee for the Development of Sunscreen Standards, and he is a member of the CS042 Standards Australia Committee for Sunscreen Test Development. And so when we're talking about uh, sunscreen and testing development, this is really the guy to know in the entire world. So welcome, John. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time. And we're going to get started with your slides here. And you can take it away now. I will uh, I will hide myself there. And uh, it's all you, John. OK, thank you, Perry. So let me uh, start by giving the coverage of what I would like to talk about in the time we are together. And they're basically standards uh, that are very fresh uh, reviews of existing sunscreen standards from ISO, or in the case of two of them, they're brand new. So what I'll be doing uh, most of the time, we'll be talking about the primary, I guess the core standard, which is ISO 24444. So that's the, the one that most of you would know, I'm sure, as the, uh, the gold standard, as we call it, for SPF testing in vivo. Uh, the others um, hang off that. Um, there's uh, an extension of that to UVA testing, in which case there are two standards, one for in vitro and one for in vivo, and I'll touch on those. And then uh, we'll um, cover two new variants, uh, both to do with water resistance. So let me tell you, uh, first of all, about why we needed to review ISO 2444. It was a new harmonised standard. We came to fruition in 2010. And uh, it's now been adopted. I, last, last count, I had about 65 countries that actually regulate. And of course, there are other countries that don't regulate that would be utilizing the method. So it's quite largely accepted around the planet. But we did, as a committee, identify there were some areas that we needed to improve. And they really were revolving around variability in the results from lab to lab. So as we started this project to review, uh, which is around about four years ago, we started to look at how we could improve the reproducibility between test labs to, to obtain our primary objective, which of course is to all produce the same SPF value. So. Let me just identify for you what I think was the core issue. And this is something that I put together. It's not a, an ISO document. It's something that I collected. And that is um, a survey of uh, laboratories. Um, in fact, I managed to obtain uh, from various directions, mainly from published information, um, the reports from different laboratories around the planet. And from the 26 that I managed to obtain, and I think there may be about 50, what we call independent labs. Uh, not, these are not in-house labs, these are independent labs. Uh, from those 26, I could only actually extrapolate any useful data on what the minimal erythemal dose was. That is the dose to produce the reddening of the skin without the product in place. So it's the important start point for the test. And as you can see from these uh, histograms of uh, the 12 labs, you might say they were fairly much all over the place. Um, the target line is, uh, in this case, the skin type two. So we should be looking uh, something like um, 250 joules 
per meter squared as the target. And uh, in many instances, uh, that's way below that. Um, what, what you would see in a lab report that would identify that, in my experience, is very low dose uh, showing it for the, uh, for the identification of the, the MED, the unprotected erythema on the skin. And these vary uh, by a factor of five, which is pretty incredibly bad. So this was our start point. We decided that we needed to target this in particular in review of the document. So just to give you an idea of other variants, um, the way that people were reporting the units, the idea was that um, they would report an MEGU um, without any real guidance. And so we had everything all over the shop from, from seconds to millijoules to meds per minute um, and all sorts of permutations. So again, we needed to do two things. One, get better reproducibility and to get consistency in the way that the units and the data was being reported. So this is important for our start point. So what we did, uh, we decided we would have defined units which would be consistent and what, you, what TISO calls normative. Normative means you have to do it if you want to comply with the standard. So what I'm talking about mostly in this document is normative requirements. So the first uh, thing that we identified was the unit and we said that the unit of effectively erythemal effective irradiation uh, needed to be in watts per, per meter squared. And then when you extend that to the dose, you're talking about the intensity times time integration. So when you multiply by time, which is usually in seconds, you will get a unit of joules. So that's the total applied energy to produce that erythema. So both of these have appeared in the standard, which was published in December of 2019. So it's quite a fresh, reasonably fresh standard. So from there, we needed then to say, how do we describe that endpoint? Um, I've had people say to me that they've looked at exposed skin and really have trouble um, in a group coming to the same agreement. Even my own uh, technicians uh, would have to compare notes and make sure that they were consistent and, of course, receive it quite a lot of training before they can identify that endpoint, but was certain that there was an issue uh, with that MED being identified after a certain dose, which appeared not to be the right dose. So here you can see um, that we're saying that it must be defined borders, which was always there, and the extra criteria was that it needs to be over more than 50% of the use of the UV exposed subside. So here I've started to put comparatives with old ISO, you'll see the ISO logo and current FDA. And in a few instances, you'll see on slides where I refer to the new proposed FDA. So here we have a, a new parameter um, to help a hope uh, in the way that we've um, uh, proposed the standard. So how does that look? Uh, well, as if it wasn't enough to describe it, if you open the coloured version of the standard, which you can uh, buy for a few more bucks, you will find a guidance in terms of how it should look on the skin. So if you can see um, exposure subsite one, bottom left, uh, in a lot of instances, that would have been called the erythema uh, endpoint, the MED. So we're more, um, I guess, specific about how you define that. I think that's a major achievement if we can get consistency between labs on that issue. So what was behind some of these variances? Um, and again, it's something that I, I go back, I reflect on my experience, was to do with the use of Fitzpatrick skin typing, which I found uh, when we started to discuss 
was quite um, a difficult tool for people to use as a guidance because as you would be aware, many people um, use the Fitzpatrick skin typing to classify the types of skin that we can use for the experiment of SPF testing. So the skin types we use, according to Fitzpatrick's, are one, twos and threes. So in the previous ISO, we allowed the option of Fitzpatrick or what's called ITA, and I'll come to that in a minute. In uh, the US, uh, Fitzpatrick is all that's defined for his skin typing. How ITA works is scientifically measuring the colour of the skin as opposed to when you look in the previous little guidance chart on the right, asking a number of questions. Um, what happens the first time you go to the beach at the beginning of the season? What's the colour of your real, the real colour of your hair? Uh, the colour of eyes, um, etc. So it's a kind of objective assessment. Whereas when you talk about ITA, you're measuring um, in the LAB colour space, you're measuring uh, quantification of the L, which you see um, is the value of uh, the, the grey scale, what you might know as the grey scale, and the B, which is the shift uh, from blue to yellow tone of the skin. So what that tool does in ITA, it, it leaves the channel uh, where the erythema appears, and so the red-green channel, the A, the A channel, opened as the endpoint. So you can discriminate uh, difference with that particular instrument. So um, a handheld spectrophotometer is used, and according to that chart that you see in the middle of the slide, you can then define very much the same skin types, but by their colour and not by some kind of subjective criteria. So this is what we've now said we need to use in ISO. This slide just indicates um, a trend line. If you use um, ITA, you are always trending the MED um, U versus the ITA in a linear fashion. If you start with one, two, three skin types and start to plot results, you'll see that you can't really see a correlation. So it, it's not helpful. So taking that into um, a single lab example, um, you can see that if you plot the ITA angle, and this is an N now of greater than 500 from um, my, old, my, my own lab in Sydney, uh, that you get a pretty good uh, consistent uh, trend. How that was interpreted into the standard, the new standard, is in fact to show data which was from over 9,000 data points collected from labs around the world. So these are labs that had the facility to measure the ITA and we collected data uh, within the committee and it's been uh, formed into that uh, correlation curve. So this is now part of the standard. It appears as Annex E in the new version of ISO 24444. To further improve that, there's a few more details such as um, We've required that you don't have a skin on a test subject which is too uneven. Um, often you'll see skin which is for various reasons, mainly probably due to, do to uh, being subjected to the sun, um, where the skin tone is quite variable over the area we use of uh, the back to, to run the exposures. And so we decided we'd give a quantifiable guidance. Again, that can be measured um, with ITA, and so you can use the same instrument to say, yeah, well, that test subject's suitable, or they have some um, blemishes, which uh, will mean that we'll get an inconsistent series of exposures when we run the uh, 
SPF test. So, skin color is defined, but it's defined in a different way. It still gives us effectively uh, types one, two, and three, but they're not uh, the same types as Fitzpatrick in that there could be quite a deal of variation between self-assessment. Uh, in my lab, I tested uh, a sample of over 300 and we found uh, in 13% of cases we had uh, misclassified. So we were setting up our exposure series for someone who said they had a sensitive type 1 skin when in fact they were a type 2, for example. So I'm sure uh, when labs work through this and discover that they're uh, not really correlating their skin types from Fitzpatrick to ITA, then in fact uh, the issue will be evident once you start running the exposures based on the calculation from ITA, you will get um, something like the, cor the correlation curve that was mentioned back here. So that's what we're trying to target by all of these improvements to some of the descriptive requirements of the standard. So again, um, ISO had the option of Fitzpatrick's. Uh, no one had real definitions of what these um, ISO bands would mean in a linear fashion, they were always still, even under the old ISO, they were still shown as being uh, types one, two, three. So I, my experience is this dramatically improves the quality of the experiment. Um, just uh, reconfirming um, that in ISO, you cannot reuse your test subjects under eight weeks and that's a variant one of the variants that sits now between uh, the fda guidance uh, which even now in the proposed rules is a minimum of four weeks only uh, but in iso it's eight weeks so that's a matter of uh, if you want to if you want to run a composite experiment uh, to incorporate both protocols and their requirements at the same time you need to be cognizant of this particular parameter. There was no difference now between uh, ISO, IELTS, ISO, new ISO and FDA in the way that the number of uh, minimum, minimum number of test subjects is, um, is accepted for validation of um, the experiment. And there's a, a allowance for a maximum also in both protocols. Uh, basically, that has not changed. Except that what we've done in the red type, you can see um, we've, we've prepared a chart, which is in the following slide, which shows you um, where you can disallow results under one circumstances, the results become invalid. So that's set out in a chart form as well as descriptively. And you can see from the headings at the top that it is relating to the unprotected MED, uh, the protected MED, which is the result for the product and the result for a reference standard. So these criteria are criteria that can be incorporated uh, both into the protocol and in my opinion, into the test report. Um, it should appear where uh, test subject data has been disallowed under one of these conditions. So that's a big uh, improvement in quantify or at least qualifying the results. We then turned to the question of the uniformity of the beams that are used from solar simulators. Solar simulators are 
generally two types now. They're either multi-ports, which are shown here on the slide. So they have typically six heads, or they may be a single port machine. In other words, they only have one head on the simulator. So what we said previously um, wasn't enough to really confirm that the calibration of the heads uh, reproducible across the whole of the beam that's projected. So this is not about the actual intensity of exposure uh, within, the, uh, within the dose that's applied to the back, but it's to do with the exposure uh, across the area of the beam. Uh, this is something that was not described either previously by ISO or currently by FDA. So what does it mean? Again, you can take uh, our good old um, handheld spectrophotometer. You can take a um, UV exposure of the end of the outlet of the solar simulators and you can uh, determine the consistency of the exposure within the circle so we don't get um, what we call in the trade half moons or areas where the exposure is too intense in which case you'll get an uneven um, result on the skin particularly the MED. So the, the sort of uh, film that's used is um, colour um, color based film um, which is um, supplied from people like um, uh, 3M, uh, Fuji film, those sort of people. They will give you um, the tools to actually measure this and calibrate uh, the intensity across the beam, whether it be a single or a multi-port. So these are film dense autometers. Connected to the instrument is a radiometer system. And the radiometer um, is uh, the tool that we use to check the intensity of the solar simulator while it's being used. So uh, again, um, there has been an issue with radiometers in the past. Uh, the quality of some that have been used have been um, not appropriate. Um, their instruments are not used for other purposes, such for measuring uh, sunlight, uh, actual, actual, actual sunlight. Uh, now we have a very elaborate, sophisticated radiometers, uh, which we can calibrate quite accurately. And as well as that, um, they can be adjusted according to a factor. Uh, and that factor allows for an error, which will be appearing in the, uh, the line that the, the baseline shift. In fact, when people look at the experimental endpoint targets that are now set within ISO 2444. So um, in my case, I went a little further and actually calibrated against the people that use to do our uh, UV indexing. But what you will find is the radiometers will vary from unit to unit. It's often difficult to check the intensity by a reference beam because the, the reference beam traceability to NIST uh, can often be not accurate in my experience. So what has to happen is eventually you will have a factor related to the experiment um, and uh, internal control of it from endpoints probably will uh, indicate that this becomes an issue with use uh, in terms of having a, an instrument, a radiometer calibrated externally by a light source that then appears to vary uh, from calibration uh, company to calibration company. That again has been an issue. So we know that if you get all this set up right, you will get 
the answers that should fit into line with that plot of um, the response curve according to the ITA of skin. And again, we're coming back to needing to get to an endpoint where you guys don't get amazing variability between labs in uh, your SPF test results. Okay, to further add to our controls, um, we've included in ISO 24444 new reference sunscreens. So they now cover the spectrum between around SPF 15 and up into the 60s. Uh, due to the limits, I guess, of the ring studies we conduct within ISO, um, we only came up with fairly broad limits at this point in time for higher SPF products. So my suspicion is in the next um, generation of the method, those uh, what appear to be very generous limits for the P6 uh, SPF 40 and the P8 SPF 60 references will most likely tighten. But this now becomes a question of um, how many reference standards do you incorporate in your experiment when we, when we know we're often testing multiple sunscreens with multiple expected SPFs and trying to incorporate them all into the same uh, study for, for real estate economics of our backs. So ISO previously um, had P2 or P3 and uh, FDA at this point is P2. So how to utilize these new high reference sunscreens? You um, need to relate them to the expected SPF. So if the expected SPF is below 24, you stick with the current ones, the P2 or P3. If you have um, greater than 25, but less than 50, you can use those intermediate SPF references. And for greater than 50, um, then the high reference standard, the P8, is appropriate. However, there's an issue uh, in the US. Uh, I'm not sure if it's resolved. There was a submission to FDA to permit use of these reference sunscreens in, in the lab for experimental purposes. Um, I'm not sure how that is resolved. Maybe someone online might be able to um, identify that. But certainly um, there are going to be issues um, for availability of appropriate reference sunscreens and how they can be incorporated economically into the experiment. So that's something that may impact on the cost of the testing. So as I said, there's no need to include the lower SPF if you're running the higher SPF sunscreens. However, um, as we transfer um, from the old method to the new method, there's going to be quite a lag period where countries won't have adopted the new method. Uh, we're always going to have situation where we're wanting to qualify for FDA as well. So I expect that in a lot of instances, labs will now have to use two reference sunscreens in the experiment. Uh, however, um, there is a proviso, and going back to the previous slide, that you can use the higher SPFs only for the last test subjects. So the last five have to be compared with a higher SPF, but the first five do not. So that's very helpful in terms of preliminary studies where three to five subjects are being used and then possibly best candidate formulation might be selected from a series. So that does help to reduce that cost. So here's something as well that's um, quite extended in detail, and that is how the product is spread on the skin. 
and uh, the committee agreed um, that we must harmonise that in quite a great deal of detail for the 2019 version. So um, some points um, that were applied. Um, the result of the amount applied being two milligrams per square centimetre is something that I don't think has been clearly understood. In, um, in the way that it's worded and in the FDA, I don't think it's very clear either. Some labs have interpreted that to mean that it's the amount that's applied to the skin by weight directly. But in fact, um, the amount that applied should be calculated by difference. And so uh, that means that uh, some of the little procedure, the, the skill, the art, uh, maybe have, may have to change in some um, situation. And uh, there is no pre-saturation of the finger cot. So to further detail that, we've now split product application into dose forms, types of products, uh, fluid products, biscuits, semi-solids, so sticks, the balms, etc., lipsticks, and then finally powders. And then with a sub-classification in A for aerosols. And this is quite detailed in the new standard. Additionally, um, the product has to be applied in small droplets uh, so that you get an even application of at least um, 15 for uh, a 30 square centimetre or um, 30 droplets for 60 square centimetres. So you really can't just apply large blobs of product into a few parts of the um, exposure target area and then trying to spread it evenly. So when you put this all together, um, if you haven't ever tried this, here is the challenge. The challenge is that it should take no longer than 35 seconds for the whole of the process. That's from the time the, um, the syringe leaves the balance and it's zero tiered at that point to the point where the product is applied and spread on the skin. I actually did uh, took, uh, took small videos within some of our labs and uh, we had a variability between 30 seconds and around four minutes in the technique that was being used. So if your technique is not achieving an even spread application of film within that time frame, it needs attention. Again, this was not specified previously. Once the product has been applied, um, there's a, a little um, pictorial description now into the standard of how the product is spread onto the skin. And again, uh, incremental pro progression of doses has been um, rejigged a little bit, but not greatly, so that it takes into account um, the possibility of both the FDA uh, variability in their, uh, the, the series of exposures or the ISO uh, consistent series uh, that should be applied within e each individual lab. So these are all things that have um, been really pushed to try and eliminate that variability issue. A few other things that I mentioned are to do with um, Acuity, um, ISO is quite clear that you need to check yearly 
for um, acuity. Um, at this point, it's a recommendation, but it's more or less applied as um, a requirement from ISO. Acuity means ability to discriminate the endpoint of the pink colour, the erythema. We also noted that there was variability in how, uh, particularly if you photograph a, um, an MED or, or an endpoint of an SPF under fluorescent only light conditions. So what we said is you cannot use fluorescent light only as your source of reading the point, the, the, the dosage applied at the endpoint. Um, so you have to use some other type of lamp. Um, the chart on the left shows the continuity of the spectrum of every other type of lamp that's commonly used at very, uh, various, um, variously around the world and compared with the wiggly line effect, the, the discontinuous spectrum for a fluorescent lamp. So that's probably the reason why um, it's difficult to see and to photograph endpoints with fluorescent light only. Okay, we're coming to the end of this now. And what I need to highlight here is that you have to be sure that the reports are consistent. So to do that, we've now said there must be a standard format for reporting. And I'm sure many people will agree that's a major achievement. There are not only single reports, but there are three types of reports that are all mandatory. The first one is to have all the data just scattered as it appears sequentially. The second is a summary form of valid data, which I guess for most purposes would be more appropriate, particularly if you're dealing with regulators. And then finally, a third format, which is a summary of, of the invalid data. So all three of these formats are shown in the standard and they are normative, they are required now. So in-house created um, reports can still be added, but these three page, single page documents are a mandatory requirement. So I think now I've covered ISO 24444 and I'm just very quickly going to cover the other standards uh, that are being published as we speak. Um, so the first one is 24444, sorry, 24442, which is the in vivo UV APF. And what you will see in that standard is all of the changes that were incorporated into 24444 copy pasted. So the only bit that will be different, obviously, will be the reference to measuring a different endpoint. Um, and that is a, a browning effect on the skin, PPD. And uh, the rest of the parameters will mirror 24444. That means that there's no need to have a separate setup for conduct of the two standards. In other words, you won't be saying that the application method's different or the reading of the endpoints different or the qualification of the test subject is different. Um, so it's being brought into line. You will see that, I guess, early 2021. Uh, the second one um, is the in vitro version of UVAPF, which is ISO 24443. And this is only run through a minor review. Uh, there's no change to it in terms of the general parameters. And uh, it only really just tidies up a little bit of technical information, but the methodology does not change. So that one um, is um, very close to publication as well. Uh, again, it will be before the end of this year. 
ISO 16217 is one of those new ones that I mentioned uh, at the beginning, and it relates to water resistance. So this is a new standard for ISO. It attempts to incorporate the parameters that have been in use in many markets around the world. And the major ones, uh, of course, have uh, been taken into consideration, um, Cosmetic Sure, the FDA and Australia. And it was published uh, at the time these slides went out a couple of weeks ago. There, it was in final, but it's now been published. I'm sorry about that. Okay, so um, it, you should be looking for that um, available from, um, from ISO uh, publications or from the Mirror publications. So what's it about? Uh, well, it's about trying to harmonise uh, not only um, the test methodologies, but also the um, types of devices and the parameters that were used uh, for test subjects. So here you can see my compilation of the devices that were in use in various labs around the planet. In Europe, they tend to be baths, so they're spa bars, and in the US, Australia, South Africa, or other places, they are what we might call jacuzzis, or, or in Australia, we call them spas. So they're larger devices. So you can see a great spread of, um, of challenge uh, immersion devices, which we had to deal with in our um, six ring studies that we conducted on this study. The next uh, big uh, discussion on is what kind of water we have to use uh, and, and specify for the test, the challenge test. And of course, the water will vary from the, from the ocean to uh, swimming pools to jumping into the river uh, or to using uh, the, the local well as uh, was raised um, in, I think, Sri Lanka by one of the delegates where the water is almost hard enough to walk on. So what we ended up with uh, was a number of parameters that we did control. Uh, they include conductivity, the water flow with a flow meter, the little propeller device, uh, the pH, the temperature of the water, the temperature of the environment, and the use of appropriate sanitizers when the spa pool's not uh, emptied, which in case of a bath it could costs would be emptied each day. The ones we didn't include were turbulence, so you might call it bubbles in the spa, or aggression, so that's high, uh, high velocity impact of the film, such as you might do, uh, you might achieve in a surfing session or some of these uh, newer sports. So they're not included in the controls within that uh, standard. Again, we've uh, managed to incorporate a reference sunscreen, and that reference sunscreen is um, limit set for it, uh, and it is challenge for water, and then a, a different uh, endpoint of its SPF. Um, that methodology has now been extended. I think this may be published this week which is the European-based um, originated um, requirement uh, for acceptable wash-off percentages. And so there is an, a, an ancillary method, uh, which is 18861, um, which describes how to work the calculations. So it's not a different method. It purely is a description of a calculation of percentage endpoint. It doesn't define pass or fail. That's left to the regulators in each market. So here we are um, in a situation where all of these standards are being accepted in most of the planet uh, with only really, I would say at this point, one outlier and that's the USA. And most of the world will eventually adopt the new versions but keep in mind that the speed with which that happens will not be great. Uh, we're still seeing countries even this year 
who are only adopting the 2010 version of um, ISO. We have a challenge now, and that challenge is to incorporate the FDA into the testing in a way that remains economical. But I believe it's doable by designing a confined uh, protocol, protocol that uh, will address both uh, targets. So that's basically my presentation, guys, and thank you for your attention and persistence. All right, thank you so much, John. Uh, are you able to hear? Say again? Are you able to hear me okay? Uh, you Let's just see. broke up a little bit. Okay. okay, there. There I'm back, okay. Well, I heard you okay, so so that works out. Uh, I just uh, want to check here. Uh, we got a ton of questions, so uh, why don't we uh, get, get some of those going now? Um, first, we'll switch off the slides here. Ah, okay, there we are. Uh, okay, uh, first of all, John, uh, a few people had asked about whether they could get the slides. Are you okay with sharing the slides or do you want people to contact you directly? Um, uh, it, it, they should be part of the online presentation, right? Yeah, yeah. If, yeah, if people wanna download the slides, yeah. we'll, uh, if, we'll if give you information me, on that. Uh, yeah, if they contact me, uh, can you uh, add the my email address somewhere? Yes, we will certainly add that. Uh, um, we will send. We will be sending an email after this for the replay information, and we'll provide all your contact information there. Yeah. Okay. So okay. My, my sci farm address. Yeah, you're you're a chemist. You're not a self promoter. You know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, let's get to some questions here. Uh, thank you. Well, and if you put more questions in, we will get to what we can. Uh, we've got John until the top of the hour, uh, but uh, that, that's all we've got. So, uh, John, the first one was going back to when you were talking about Fitzpatrick uh, 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 skin types. Tina wanted to know, is the correlation study of the ITA and the Fitzpatrick measurements, is it published in any journal or is that just an ISO 24444? Uh, it's a document I've published actually in our Australian journal, which is uh, is available if uh, if they request it, I'll give them a copy. Okay, great. Um, next question. Actually, this is the question that I had. I had just read uh, a study that Johnson and Johnson did, which suggested that an SPF 100 plus provided some measurably better real life protection than an SPF 50. Uh, do the new standards uh, cover going up to say SPF 100s? Oh yeah, without a doubt. Yeah. Okay. Does that surprise you that the the 100 provides some sort of measurable difference? I've I've often heard that uh, 100 was more of a marketing ploy. Uh, I, I would I would question the fact that the SPF, according to my reading of that study, was not actually tested according to the SPF method. Ah, it, the, right. the label, the label claim was compared within use, according to my interpretation. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, oh, okay, uh, and we'll get through as many questions as we can here. Uh, Juliana says, uh, when you say that the data for the test product is rejected, does it mean that we should consider the standard result as a valid result and consider it uh, for the standards uh, mean SPF? even though the product's result is invalid? Uh, I, I would say generally you would have to reject the reference sunscreen results compared with the uh, product result. If the product result was invalid, then I guess the whole line cancels out. However, if you are accumulating data for a validation, which is actually part of the water resistant SPF, then in that case, you would still make use of that data to validate your reference on screen. So it could be used for another purpose, but I wouldn't advise that you include it in the, um, in the valid results. You have to really end up with, with 10 results in that clean version of the, uh, of the report document. In any case. Makes sense. 
Um, Daniela asked, uh, does the does does this standard apply to different dosage forms? For example, we have powders, we have sprays, we have mists. Um, how do you account for that? Yeah, in the in ISO 24444, we um, have shown it to be valid for all the dose forms that have been, I guess, invented. Um, however, if you look at uh, in vitro methods, then there are certainly restrictions. Uh, for instance, 24443 has not been validated for powders. Oh, so right. It's, it's horses for courses, but for the core gold standard 24444, yes, all products should be qualified in the same fashion. Okay, excellent. Uh, Leah says, I want to ask about the rejection subject in ISO 2444. Uh, is it a new criteria for the ISO 2444 or did this exist in the last ISO 2444? Yeah, it, to some degree it existed, but it wasn't uh, set out in a chart form. So it's much more user friendly. Yeah, and how many maximum subject rejections are allowed in the ISO 2444? Uh, up, up to five um, are allowed, uh, depending on the criteria. Yeah. Um, but uh, you, can you, you can test up to 25 in total. But the variability is the issue. Once you get to 10, then you can run up to 20 if the variability is not there. But Hopefully, if you follow the improved methodology, you shouldn't see that kind of variability, uh, which is necessary, particularly FDA, the, the more strict on variability and the need to, to move much above 10 test subjects. Because most of that, in my experience, will come from misinterpreting skin types. So we go back to the, the benefits of ITA. Yeah. Makes sense. Uh, Hilda wanted to know, is there any correlation between in vitro SPF and in vivo SPF testing? If you're talking about methods outside of ISO, then so far um, there's not been um, a great deal of correlation up until, and I didn't discuss this because it's a totally different subject, the new yeah. methods that are being uh, worked through at ISO present. Uh, one is uh, from Cosmetics Europe, involves the use of different um, types of, two different types of um, films, plates for application of the product. So the in vitro results of that uh, are, are under discussion at present. Um, and then there's another coming method which is related to, it's called HDRS, it's related to uh, the use of measurement of uh, the intensity of response actually from the skin. So it's a hybrid, if you like, between in vivo and in vitro and that looks very promising and it's currently being to the point where it's been uh, validated on all sorts of products very big, large, very big spectrum of, uh, of dose types. That's looking like something that will be very promising in the next few years. So yes, there are other, even more in vitro methods under development, but up to date on what's been published officially, uh, difficult to correlate. It's yeah, a guidance yeah. for comparing uh, um, closely matched formulas when, yeah. when you're looking at and an improvement line for R&D, but not for qualification of SPF at this point. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Um, Nicole wants to know, is the test for product wash off, is that now invalid or is that justified? Uh, the, the test for wash off is the new um, 18861 method, um, which is, as I said, I think may be published today or in the next few days. Um, that's valid uh, as, as an extension of the in vitro water resistance test. Um, the in-house wash off tests um, tend to be lab dependent. So test labs uh, have their own methodology. There's no real published um, agreed kind of in vitro 
water resistance test at this point. But I can say that uh, HDRS, um, because you're using human subjects still, um, will be able to allow for that. So you'll have a an in vitro or ex, F, ex vivo, what you might call it, but we call it hybrid um, intermediate test, which yeah. will be able to be used certainly for screening at least. All right. Here is one sort of a detail, but Chelsea wants to know regarding the use of finger cots, is the type uh, slash brand of the finger cot, is that specified? It, the general description, we can't specify brands, but general description is specified. And yes, um, they do vary. And that is why um, pre impregnation of it is also a um, uh, Contraindicated. It's it's not advised um, because, uh, in fact, there was a published paper on this. Um, the amount that's absorbed is dependent on the the brand and, and type of the um, finger cots. Okay. Uh, someone wants to know how do you correlate the SPF and the real life protection, keeping in mind the variability of the quantities used by consumers. Um. We already know well and truly that um, around the world, people underutilize sunscreens. Um, I just have published something on this. And if that person again can email me, um, showing how much safety factor there also is in the environment, because the maximum exposure at any place on the earth, that's direct sunlight, um, happens to be in um, Darwin in Northern Australia. And it's around about the equivalent of 35 MEDs. So if you're applying a 50 or 60 at, uh, at half the dose and half the efficacy, um, then you're still well protected over the day. That's why we should not see burns uh, with people who have a real SPF 50 or greater, even under applied. So what I'm yeah. saying is we do, have, although we have a, a for reasons of um, reproducibility, set two milligrams per square centimetre within all standards. There's never been any other standard that didn't have it. Um, there is there is a safety factor inherent because of the challenge of the light over the day. So except for extreme situations, uh, that film should still perform over the course of a, of a day. But uh, you can send yeah. me an uh, inquiry on that. Sure, sure. And j just uh, related to that one, somebody asked uh, if, if you guys know that the two milligrams per centimeter is a lot more than consumers use, uh, what was the rationale for sticking with that uh, for like the next standard? Yeah, it, 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 it goes way back um, and it was uh, determined that you could not get reproducibility in the experiment without applying that. Um, skin roughness is part of the issue, major probably. And the skin roughness between, uh, between newborns and, uh, and uh, people around my vintage um, varies extremely. So yeah. we, we know, for example, that on a, a PMMA plate, it takes around a half a milligram just to fill the, uh, the Grand Canyon, the, sort of the holes on the plate, the scratches that are on them. Um, so you won't get a continuous film. Um, and uh, that, that actually is one of the issues with the FDA um, recommendation to only use um, 0.8 milligrams um, on their test. We know, for instance, in uh, in vitro that we have to use 1.3 on a roughness um, plate of the plate, the RA of about five or six. So yeah, it's because uh, we just wouldn't get answers. So there's definitely a rationale to it. Um, just uh, time for a couple more questions. Uh, Lisa wants to know, when are these changes going to be incorporated, do you think? Well, technically, anyone who's using ISO methods now has to comply within two months of publication with the 
new versions of the methods. However, um, the regulators are notorious for dragging their feet. And yeah. uh, as I said, uh, it will be dependent on, um, on the market you're targeting. I can say for Australia, uh, we just about finished redrafting our new version of our internal mirror document and we'll have that published by the end of this year. So we're probably cab first cab off the rank in terms of picking up the standards, uh, new versions and the new water resistant standard in, um, in a regulation. But yeah, there are countries still that say, uh, I want the uh, testing done to uh, 1998 or 2003. Um, and it's difficult to accommodate into uh, the new requirements. <laughs> to some that's... degree, some degree you can reverse engineer, but you're safer to be proactive. So my recommendation is get your product. If you've got new products, get them tested with new standards now, because they're still going to be compliant with the old ones. Yeah, makes sense. All right, John. We that does bring us to the top of the hour. We do have one last question. I just want to get your uh, thoughts on this. Um, is there any thought to including uh, blue light testing uh, in exposure limits? Uh, blue light is kind of being touted now as the new thing that people have to worry about. Is there any kind of have, testing with that? We have discussions for blue light, for, um, for uh, red light, <laughs> infrared, and yeah. for visible light. Uh, my personal uh, impression is that they are not as important and keep in mind that ISO norms are not generated from ISO. They're actually generated from other bodies, the member bodies, which are usually uh, standards associations. Uh, so we don't actually create the methods, we evaluate them and try to harmonize them. So I suspect if ever, it'll be a long time before any other variations on the UV will come to fruition as international yeah. documents. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. All right, John. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody who attended. I'm sorry if we didn't get to your questions. Uh, we're going to try to compile all of the questions, and I'll send them to John. And if he has a chance to answer, uh, we can do follow-ups. We'll also provide you with John's contact information when we send you information about the replay. Uh, in that information, we'll also uh, provide you uh, a link for uh, for the slides and such. Um, just uh, to let you know, in two weeks, we're gonna have another webinar um, on uh, uh, the topic of uh, uh, the, the environmental impact on your skin. And uh, there's a whole new science related to that. So it it's, uh, sounds like an interesting, interesting new talk and I'm looking forward to that one. John, uh, do you have anything else to add before we let you go? No guys, stay safe. All right. Yeah, you too. Well, thanks everybody. And until next time, uh, I'm Perry Romanowski. This is the IFSCC webinar series. Thanks a lot, John. Bye. Good night. Good day. <laughs>
everywhere in the world, uh, we have a program where we uh, send send speakers from different parts in the world to other parts in the world. Uh, unfortunately, with the pandemic going on, we haven't been sending anybody to do any live talks, but that is gave us the opportunity to embrace the online world. And so we've been doing these webinars. This is our fourth webinar in the series. And so far, this is our most highly attended webinar. Uh, John, it looks like we got 50 people already online. Hello, everyone. John, why don't you tell us where you're from right now? Where are you at? Okay, so I'm sitting in my office in uh, what's usually sunny Sydney. And uh, I recently retired after 55 years in the industry, but as you can see, I'm still working. So I'm doing a little bit of uh, <laughs> part-time consulting and restricted purely to sunscreens. Um, I, ah, take also, I take also the, um, the hat of being a scientific director for solar for Eurofins, which is an uh, international group. Employs about 40,000 people and included in the 1,200 labs, they have eight which are dedicated to solar. So that oh. eight labs is, comes under my bag. Uh, excellent. Well, it looks like we've got our first uh, person checking in. Hello, Paul. Paul from, uh, he's from uh, Australia, New Zealand uh, supplier. So he's from your neck of the woods. Actually, John, I was in Sydney uh, a couple of years ago. I got a chance to visit Sydney and it's a wonderful city. I have to say, I, I like it a lot. Yeah, it's cool. Um, we're, now, we're now out of lockdown, thank heavens. Oh, Most really? Was... We can move around the state. We can't move around the country. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a... Uh, the city i very much enjoyed it it reminded me a lot of uh here in north america toronto uh except toronto with palm trees so <laughs> i liked it a lot hey we've got david steinberg uh uh online hello my old friend yeah <laughs> hello david uh david i think he's in new jersey at the moment uh and look at that erwin uh plus um Hello, Erwin. Uh, welcome, boy. Uh, these these two guys are have been in the industry for a while. Uh, you know both of them, right, John? Sure do. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, we are going to get started in just about ten minutes. Um, uh, looking forward to John's talk. Uh, but as you join here, uh, why don't you uh, let us know? Uh, you just say hello and let us know where you're from. Uh, Wendy says good day, uh, which I'm assuming she's from Australia. <laughs> Uh, well, welcome, uh, Philip. Philip. Philip's uh, working in Singapore. Hello, Philip. Uh, glad to have you here. Hi, Phil. You know, uh, uh, and then of course Mary Lynn. She's uh, Mary Lynn's uh, in headquarters in New York City. She's here. Uh, sorry, I don't have my glasses on, so it's hard to read. But Maria, uh, Maria is from Mexico. Uh, and so uh, we've got people from all over the world. Right now, John, we've got 80 people uh, online. They're looking forward to, to what you have to say. But you know, while we have uh, a chance, we have a few minutes, I always like to get a sense of how people got involved in the cosmetic industry. So John, why don't you give us a little uh, background? How did you get started in the cosmetic industry? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I actually donned my first white coat in 1964 when I uh, managed to get a position at the pharmacy school at Sydney Uni, not as a student, but working in the lab while I was studying. So uh, I was fortunate enough to come across uh, a few uh, interesting formularies and uh, they'd started me down the path of understanding there was uh, other things besides pharmaceutical products um, to use as um, personal care. So. Um, from there, I was thrown in the deep end, actually, only aged 18 when I uh, was given a position of something called a chief chemist, uh, which was a role in charge of R&D and QA, uh, the manufacturing division of a um, pharmaceutical chain, a pharmacy chain. Yeah. So, um, that was there that I was given um, uh, a my first recipe book, I guess you would call, in 1966 from Lester Conrad, uh, from Amicol. So, okay. Yes. Uh, you, m many old members would know him as uh, one of the founders of SCC and uh, one of the major instigators of IFSCC. So more or less threw me in the deep end even further. 
Uh, so I joined the local society, the Australian Society of Cosmetic Chemists, and uh, I attended their second seminar. And from there on, um, my interest didn't wane over the 55 years. Yeah, Australian uh, society has been around for a little while, huh? Yeah, so we, we recently celebrated our 50th anniversary. That's right. And you had said you had put together like a history of the uh, society there. Yeah, that was, I think I was there for that presentation. It's very, very interesting. Yeah, so that was really uh, making sure that we didn't lose sight of our beginnings. Well, uh, just let me check in with everybody here. Hello and welcome. This is the uh, the fourth in our series of IFSCC webinars. Uh, today we have John Stanton. He's going to be talking to us about sunscreen all the way from uh, Sydney, Australia. Uh, as you check in, you'll see on the chat box there. Uh, why don't you let us know uh, where you're from and uh, say hello. We've got uh, uh, Maritza from, uh, or I'm sorry, Marlies from South Africa. Uh, we had Gary from Chicagoland. I think I, I might know Gary. Um, uh, Sergio from uh, Mexico. Chris from Singapore. John, we've got people from all over the world. Um, I haven't seen anybody from Europe, but I think right now in Europe, uh, it's what, uh, two or three in the morning or something like that. So sorry, you're, you're going to have to watch it on the replay if you're from Europe. John, you've been in the industry for a long time. Uh, now, a lot of people that are coming onto this webinar today have just started in the industry. Uh, before we get started, do you have any tips for somebody who's just starting a career? Uh, anything that might help make their uh, career as a cosmetic chemist or cosmetic scientist uh, more interesting and fun? Well, I think the major message is get involved. Um, don't, uh, don't sit back and, and take one way feed. Um, my experience is that uh, communicating with people, at, particularly at conferences and scientific meetings, um, is your most valuable asset. I certainly came from a situation where there was very little in writing about cosmetics back in my days. There was just oh, yeah. a few old formulas in recipe books and uh, no one really knew why they hung together. And uh, the, the scientific, the most amazing tool we had was HB, uh, HLB and um, we do nothing really about uh, how, how products hung together. So yeah. uh, if, I, if I hadn't started at the bench, uh, I think I wouldn't have um, absorbed as much as I hope I have. Probably most have forgotten since, but, but as I say, um, if you participate, um, it's really uh, the way to uh, achieve. And the network is brilliant, and uh, often it's helpful as to who you know as well as what you know. And uh, John, uh, have you had a chance to, I imagine as uh, in the industry, you've had a chance to travel around the world giving talks and such? I know you came to the United States uh, in 2016. Yeah, yeah well, I, got, I got on this international speaker circuit, I guess, um, uh, many, many years ago, at least, at least 20 years ago. So... Uh, from there, um, I've certainly seen a lot of the planet. And again, it's, it's a marvelous way to um, pick up uh, experience and, uh, and additional knowledge. Yeah, excellent. All right, we're gonna get started in, looks like just four minutes, John. Um, and uh, if you're just joining us, uh, you are here for an IFSCC webinar. I'm Perry Romanowski, uh, the Education Chair for the IFSCC Education Committee. Uh, we have John Statton. He's going to be our uh, speaker tonight. Uh, well, I say tonight. For him, it's uh, 11 o'clock in the morning, so it's morning for you. Actually, I, it's, it's actually quite amazing that right now for you, it's Wednesday and it's Tuesday for me here. But uh, the great thing about technology is that we can actually hold this at a time that's reasonable for the both of us. Uh, and, and we've got a lot of people in. We've got, uh, let's see, um, Melissa from Istanbul has checked in. Welcome. We got Jennifer from Los Angeles, uh, Claudia from Argentina. Uh, we've got uh, Lima from Vancouver. Welcome, everybody. It's so good to, to have you here. Uh, so good to have so many people on the live webinar. John, we're up to 176 people on online right now. So I, I have to say, you had a lot of people uh, who were who are interested in hearing you talk and uh, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions. Speaking of questions, during the talk, uh, you're going to see you're going to see John, you're not going to see me, you're just seeing me for the beginning here. Um, and as he goes through the slides, 
if you have questions, feel free to post your questions in the chat room there, in the chat box there. I'm going to collect all the questions. Uh, and then at the end, we're going to have a short question and answer session. Uh, so if you have questions as he goes through the slides and the presentation, feel free to post those questions in there. Uh, Adriana from Delaware. Hello, Adriana. We've got uh, Jamela from the Philippines. Wow, we've got, John, got people all over the world here. And we're going to get started in just two minutes. Um, I think I've covered everything. I, I did have actually uh, one thing that else that I wanted to say. If for some reason uh, you have a technical problem, the, the audio checks out or something like that, the first thing you should do as an audience member is hit the refresh button on your uh, computer. Uh, the quality of the audio and the video is, is dependent really on your internet quality. And sometimes things can jump around and it still does amaze me that, uh, you know, you're on the other side of the planet a day ahead of me and then we're able to do, I think it, I think it's great though. I'm, I'm so, I'm so glad that you had took the time here to, to participate in this. And I'm really looking forward to the talk, which will begin in one minute. Well, uh, actually, John, I think uh, you got anything else to add before we get started? Uh, no, I think um, I'll take it as slowly as I can um, and uh, make sure that I don't uh, lose anyone with my fast talk. And uh, <laughs> uh, hello, world. All right. Well, why don't we get started? I'll give you a little introduction. And we'll get the slides going. Um,